Um, congratulations to those of you who made it here. Um, it was kind of ugly out on the streets this morning. Not as ugly as we might like. And those of you who had to deal with kids this morning because they were in school, um, greatly appreciated that you're here. Um, I did want to mention, however, if at some point you do need to bring your kids, as long as not all of you do at the same time, um, they're welcome here as long as they're quiet. So I totally understand being a dad myself that that's something that um, we need to deal with um, from time to time. So some of you may also have noticed that um, I have a mic and um, all of this is being, you know, not only over the loudspeakers, even though I'm plenty loud enough anyway, um, it's being recorded. And so all of my lectures end up on YouTube. Um, so some of you may know that already. Um, so let's go ahead and get started. A um, couple of things, uh, basically where to find me when I'm not here. Uh, the best way by far to reach me is by email. I'm kind of email dependent and um, check it, well, not quite 24-7, but um, close enough. That's by far and away the best way to reach me. Um, you can try looking in my office. Sometimes I'm there, sometimes I'm not. Um, that's over in uh, SRTC. Um, those of you who've been here long enough may know it as Science Building 2, but anybody still know it as Science Building 2? Nobody? Okay, so I can stop dropping that line. Although appropriately given last year, I like to call it the building previously known as Science Building 2. And some of you may get that reference relative to 2016. Um, so I'm also, I say my lab is on Facebook, I should say, um, Ken S. Lab. Uh, basically what I post on there is stuff that I think is cool um, and may or may not have anything to do with the class. I'm certainly not going to test anything that I post on my Facebook page, but it's stuff that I think is, is pretty cool. Actually, I just posted something about CRISPRs and anti-CRISPRs on there. We'll be talking about CRISPRs towards the end of class. Um, some really fascinating stuff. In fact, an ex-graduate student from PSU just discovered and published in Cell. Um, I got dragged kicking and screaming onto Twitter um, as of about three or four weeks ago. If you want to follow me, great. If you don't, that's totally fine as well. Um, again, um, just stuff that I think is, is cool and interesting. And as you may gather from my handle, um, it's mostly going to be about viruses because viruses are like the coolest thing in the universe, which is literally a paper that I'm working on right now. Um, and the other thing, and probably most important for you guys, is on YouTube. Again, my YouTube channel has all of the lectures that I give in this class, but also all the previous years. So if you want to try and get ahead a little bit, you can always go back and check those. What I put on there is this audio and the video that you see on the screen. Um, as uh, I just heard a great quote the other day, one of the podcasts I listened to, um, the guy's a great radio voice and a great radio face, i.e. you don't want to be looking at me any more than you absolutely have to. Um, do have a website. It's not updated really much at all. Um, something's got to drop eventually. Um, you can try reaching my voicemail if you like. Um, it's not very useful. Again, just send an email. Um, I am working on a couple of other things as well as teaching and being in the lab. Um, I run a small company called Stone Stable Inc. If you're interested in what I'm doing there, um, you can go to the YouTube channel. There's actually a little video on what we're doing down there. Um, I'm also trying to make a film. Um, edge of life on how amazing viruses are. Again, that's kind of like the website. It hasn't been updated in a little bit too long. Uh, let's see, we can go <clears throat> this class. Uh, it's, we could spend you know, the next four or five years talking about molecular biology. And by the time we got done after those five years, actually after about a year, we'd have to start again because it's all new. Uh, but basically the idea of this class being a 300 level class is really sort of an introduction to the fundamentals of molecular biology not getting into depth in any particular area, even though you may feel like that sometimes, um, but really sort of to try and give you the basics, as it were, in terms of how biology works, at least from, from my point of view, and really focusing on the nucleic acids. We're not going to talk very much about proteins in this class. There are a couple of other classes that do a really good job talking about proteins, and it's a whole huge thing in and of itself. <laughs> Uh, we'll start out doing a little bit of chemistry and genetics review for people. How many of you have had genetics already? 
Okay, quite a few of you. There will be some overlap between that and here. How many are taking genetics now if it's being offered? Okay, yeah. So there will be a little bit of overlap between the two, um, but shouldn't be too much. We're trying to minimize that. Uh, a lot about DNA, RNA, structure, and of course, when I say structure, that means function. Exactly. Very good. Someone's taking biochemistry. Um, so that we're really going to be concentrating on what the structure looks like. Um, talk a little bit about genomes. Again, a lot of these things could be whole subjects in and of themselves. Um, how DNA gets replicated into more DNA and how mistakes are made and how mistakes get repaired. It's a big section of what we're going to be talking about. Then we'll, you know, go over to the other side, talk about RNA, um, how RNA is made from a DNA copy, how, of course, that, again, that's translated into protein, and then all the funky things that happen with RNA just in that process. But as I've probably said for years and years, and you go back and listen to last year's lecture and the year before that, I probably always say we could do a whole course on RNA really easily um, because RNA is really one of the biological macromolecules in the last probably 10 years. Uh, it's become much more obvious that we know a lot less about what RNA is doing than we thought we did. Um, so we'll spend a bit of time talking about that and then regulation sort of um, towards the ends of the course. A number of people have asked me about prerequisites and I know this is slightly different than the other faculty member who teaches molecular biology who will remain nameless. Wonderful guy. I absolutely love him. Uh, this, I expect you to know GenChem, pretty much up and down, um, and we'll cover that in the next couple of <clears throat> lectures. Um, principles of biology, if you have not taken principles of biology or the equivalent, particularly 251, this class is going to be exceedingly hard for you, um, and I would recommend that you drop it immediately. Don't everybody get up and leave right now. Um, but <clears throat> That's really, really critical as far as this is. The second two parts, and actually 251's changed. Um, the numbering has changed now. Sorry about that. But just the first term of principles. Um, helpful, but again, not required. Genetics, the genetics we talk about here is really pretty minimal. We will cover a few things, but very sort of broad brush kinds of things. Um, OCHEM, how many people have had OCHEM? OK, bunch of you. Um, most of the stuff, we, we cover like four reactions in this course. So um, it's pretty minimal relative to that. Uh, biochemistry, how many of you had biochemistry? There'll be a certain amount of overlap with that as well. Um, but there, the chemistry professors get a lot more into the energetics, the proteins, et cetera, um, in that particular class, um, which I highly recommend. In fact, if you can ever fit it into your schedule and you think about biochemistry, take the 490 series. It's infinitely better than the, the 351. Um, micro, how many micro people? None, a few, some taking it now. Okay, so um, not really critical. There are a few things, again, that I'll try and um, fill in. Cell biology, in theory, all of you take this before you take that in practice. Anybody taking them at the same time? Okay, um, shouldn't be a huge problem. We actually switched these two a couple of years ago. Um, but given the textbook, which I didn't bring with me because it's ridiculously heavy, uh, we've decided to switch the order a little bit, and I completely agree with that other professor that it's an appropriate way to do it. Uh, course materials, uh, basically, and people always ask me about this, where do the questions on exams come from? They come from lectures. They don't come from the book. Um, they really come from the lectures. Um, this is an absolutely fabulous textbook also really thick, um, but it's one of the most recent ones. Um, you'll notice here 2014, and as I mentioned a little earlier, molecular biology moves so ridiculously fast that having a textbook that's more than a couple of years old ends up being out of date pretty quickly, and particularly for some of these things like RNA, CRISPR technology, etc. cetera. Um, this book covers CRISPR technology very briefly. Um, I have books on CRISPR technology, and we'll probably spend a while talking about that a little bit later on in the class. Um, we're only going to cover chapters one through eight and just skim over two and three. Um, and that's plenty um, as far as is concerned. Um, D2L, anybody not know D2L? OK, 
Okay, good, um, because um, there'll be a lot of things on there, um, particularly additional reading materials. Um, all of the presentations, PowerPoints are uploaded. Anybody upload those today before they came to class? Good, okay, it's all there, should be. If it isn't, please um, let me know. I try and get things uploaded by about 10 o'clock the night before. Um, and if not, all of the older materials are on there, I think for about the last 10 years um, on D2L. So if you ever feel you want to go back and look at something, slightly different way of looking at it, um, it's all there, syllabus, notes, et cetera. We'll go and take a quick look at D2L a little bit later on. Um, YouTube channel, I think this is the right link, but the easiest way to find it is just to search for Ken Stedman um, on YouTube and you will find it. <clears throat> Molecular biology is more than just this ridiculously thick book. Um, there are lots of other texts around. The library has a number of copies. I'm going to try and get a copy of this textbook on reserve in the library, the newest one. I'll certainly put some of the older ones on there. Um, the previous edition of the textbook, um, the fifth edition, um, is a big red one. Anyone have the red one, seen the red one? Uh, it's pretty close to this one, um, but there are a few things that are updated and I'll try and um, get you guys to that. Um, the fourth edition is actually in its entirety free online. So um, if you're trying to share books or something like that, um, it's all here at um, this particular link. Um, lots, again, lots and lots of other textbooks, many of them available in the library. So there's something that we've gone over in class, you're like, hmm, clueless, he's not responding to my emails. Um, there's lots of other ways to get some of that material. Unfortunately, we also do these exam things. Um, the way this class works, um, we have two midterms and a final. Um, these are the dates, 1st of February, 24th of February, and the finals on the 22nd of March, I think. Let me check. I'll have to check on that one. Um, I may have that off a little bit. It's definitely not at 8 a.m. on Tuesday, so I will make sure that gets updated. Um, exams will be all multiple choice. Um, I don't like doing that, but you'll notice all of the massive numbers of TAs I have here to help me with. Good. Um, so uh, they end up being um, all multiple choice and scantrons. Um, you can tell by the emoji that I'm not that wild about it. Um, you may have noticed by adding up the three exam grades, 30% each, where's the other 10% come from? Um, comes from our friends, the clickers. Yes, we love them, we hate them. Depends on your point of view. Um, we'll be doing those starting to count next week, starting on Wednesday, because we don't have class on Monday for Martin Luther King Day. Um, and then that will go every lecture, including some of the review lectures that I will do, will always have some of those clicker questions. A number of those clicker questions are going to end up on exams um, and very similar kinds of questions, partly to give you an idea of the kind of questions that I ask, but also for me to get a little bit of feedback in terms of, of where we are. In the past, I've done clicker questions right at the beginning as sort of a review for the previous lecture, and then after the clickers, half the people got up and left, um, which I think is kind of counterproductive, certainly from my point of view. So the clicker's actually gonna be throughout the lecture, about every 10, 15 minutes probably. Uh, there's some pretty good research in terms of education that says that's about the time that people can concentrate. Um, so having those breaks every once in a while I think is very useful. Um, I did that in virology last time and it seemed to work reasonably well. So that being said, all of you who have your clickers, we'll do our clicker question number one, uh, <clears throat> which is, which of the following best describes you? Junior biology major, senior biology major, post -back, junior, senior, non-biology major, none of the above. So, um, it should be AA. And it will always count down, it'll always be a minute. Oh, and by the way, you, you certainly can discuss clicker questions with your neighbors. Whether you want to discuss it right now with your neighbor, I don't know, but <laughs> it's up to you. I like E. Always go for every, anytime Stedman asks a question you don't know about, just go for E. Yes. 
Um, yeah, I'll, I'll talk about uh, the clicker registration um, on iClicker, iClicker.com. Um, I haven't got the D2L one working, and unfortunately, um, you have to pay seven bucks if you go through iClicker.com. But I haven't worked this. Ever people gotten to work out just through D2L? I just registered mine, and I didn't ask them to on iClicker. Yeah. Um, if they're new or not, if they don't ask, great. If they're new, you don't. But if they're used, you do have to. You have to. Um, the, once you register, however, you should. That's to be your only time that you have to. So I'm sorry. I, school's expensive enough anyway. It's partly actually why we have that textbook because we also use it for cell biology. It's ridiculously expensive, but at least you can use it for two classes. So that actually is right here. So um, register. Um, all of the the software actually stores all of that information just based on the clicker number. The main thing we need to do is collect that clicker number to you. And that has to be done uh, by the midterm if you actually want to see your clicker scores. If you don't really care until the end of the class, that doesn't really matter. But um, if you want to see them, please go to iClicker. And again, it's a one-time registration. If you have a used clicker, if you have a new one, um, you don't need to, to do that at all. So any um, clicker questions, um, you can come up and find me um, after class, and, and we can talk about that. So what do we do with these? 100% of the points. Uh, what I do is I normalize the top score in the class to 100%. So those of you who've had my classes before or talked to other people who have, um, high scores on my 50 question multiple choice exams are usually about 40. So um, that means that there are probably 10 bad questions on the exam. So what I do is I'll just normalize to the high score across the board, and then calculate based on that percentages just to give people grades. And so that I found works a lot better than taking the mean and doing standard deviations. This is what I used to do and really confused people. Um, so I just said, OK, we'll go ahead and just do this. Um, scoring ends up getting a very similar kind of score distribution. Um, occasionally, we get ringers, and you know who you are. <laughs> um, and I just throw you guys out. I'll, you'll get the A, and you'll be fine. Um, so um, usually, the normalization for the final grades ends up being actually a little bit lower than the absolute top score in the class. So are there any questions about sort of the clickers, the grading, the exams, et cetera? Yes? So I'll give you the scores. I'm oh, sorry to repeat the question since you know, people aren't here getting the recording. Um, the question is, do I normalize after every exam or do I normalize at the end? I only, when I assign grades, I take the whole thing all the way across, do that total number of points, and then finally do the grades at the very end. Give you an idea of where you stand, I'll give you the scores for each of those exams as well, and the high scores, et cetera. Those will all be posted on D2L. Other questions uh, about that? OK. How do you do well in this class? A um, couple of things, the things that people have told me over the years. Um, probably the number one best thing to do is to go and look up the old exams. Um, I've got, again, about 10 years worth of exams with keys, actually without keys and with keys on D2L. Best thing to do is go and look at those exams. Um, I try not to use the same questions. I actually make up new questions every year. But somehow, there's some similar things that end up in here. So um, great way. Also gives you an idea what kinds of questions, what things I'm likely to be asking. Um, YouTube, people find this to be incredibly useful. It used to be I had about 12 recorders up here at the front. And I decided instead of having that, um, and a way to coordinate it with what's going on on the screen, I'll just record things and throw them up on YouTube. Why anyone wants to listen to my voice again, I don't know, but um, apparently it's very useful. Um, office hours will be right after class, and usually in here. I don't know if there's another class in here. Um, if there isn't, we'll just stay here. If not, we'll head back over to SRTC and, and do office hours over there. It's kind of a cliche, but I think it's really true. The best way to try and learn something is by to try to teach it to someone else. Um, I think study groups are incredibly useful. Um, probably the most active study group that I had last year 
I think there were six of them. At least five of them ended up with A's in the class. Um, but um, great idea to get together and chat about this. Um, there should be, was it Buddy Up, I think, the, the app that helps you form these. Um, D2L, the discussion tool on D2L is a great way to try and organize things. People will reserve rooms over in the library so you can get together and talk about stuff. Often what happens is study groups get together and they talk about things that I talked about that obviously weren't terribly well explained, and then they come and talk to me, and I try and explain it again. Um, but that works, I think, really, really well. Discussion tool on D2L. Any question that comes to me, be it from a study group, um, certainly anything that's been emailed to me, I will copy that question with my answer and put it on the discussion group in D2L. There's a whole questions section in there. And so I usually find that if one person has a question or one study group has a question, it's probably more than that one person or that one study group. Um, so I will try and post all of those um, as quickly as possible. In-class review before exams, there's no new material on the last lecture before exams. I will just go back and it's kind of a safety net for me because I figure I haven't explained something particularly well. Get to go back and explain it again. Um, and things that I think are particularly important there is zero guarantee whatsoever if any of those things are going to end up on the exam, but it's certainly things that I think are um, important. The other thing, bright red, whenever Stedman thinks it's important, he puts it in red. Ask questions. Uh, some things that people have found, great way to slow me down is to ask questions. And uh, again, if you have a question, probably a large portion of the other students in the class also have a very similar question, if not exactly the same one. Um, so I highly recommend asking questions either here in class, on email. Um, you can on D2L, but I suggest actually sending me an email, and then I'll just post that on D2L. I think that works a little bit better. Um, Got to go through this. If I make a mistake, I am human most of the time. Uh, please let me know, because sometimes I'll just misadd a number. There's a disconnect sometimes between these things. Um, cheating, this is all in the syllabus. Um, I don't require attendance. Of course, you get clicker points if you're here. I do highly recommend it, and the reason I do that is that I do surveys at the end of each year, and people who almost always come to class generally do better than those who come to class rarely. So that's just what people have told me, and I see those numbers. I don't, yeah, everybody gets a point for answering this question. Makeup exams. Life happens. Uh, it has to be something which is pretty soon. You really cannot be here. Um, just because you're ill, um, et cetera, you haven't studied enough, um, that's not appropriate. I do need written evidence. Um, here it says the exam will be short answer. Um, short answer usually ends up being about half a page. So, uh, and you can go online and find out what people think about my makeup exams. Uh, syllabus. It's on the website, and I did want to try and click through to this. Um, we can take a quick look at it, if it will open up, except it's not finding it here. Now, go to Still trying to get used to this classroom. Here we are. D2L. Just to give you a bit of an overview what what's on here. Yeah. Of course, now it didn't like me. Try again. <laughs> Knew there was something else I should have done before we got started. Here we are. So. This is what this should look like. Molecular biology, right here. Here, uh, yes, yes. Class are canceled. We are actually here. Um, usually, just go to course content. Here, this is the syllabus. Lectures. I'll post all PowerPoints for the lectures here. Those of you who look at the syllabus, notice that I want you to read Watson and Crick's paper. It's right here. A few other links to. 
DNA, DNA molecular biology, probably the one that you're most interested in is going to be this one, the old exams. Um, you notice there's 79 old exams in there. Last year's, the year before that, the year before that, um, the year before that, years even before that, uh, something like vaccination, um, and then yeah, there's this movie thing as well at the end here. I did want to briefly look at the syllabus. Here's here. We have a, no, I should have evolving syllabus because it will change as we go through. Here, I try and keep it up to date. Um, today, hopefully we'll get a chance to talk about some actual material, genetics and genomics, um, some of the reviews, and then just sort of move our way through the course here, um, basically starting again with one, two, and three pretty quickly, a couple lectures on four, a couple on five, midterm will be on the first eight lectures, five and six, the next midterm on lectures six through 19, and then the final exam on 17 through 24. You'll notice this one here, 1st of March, um, is in italics. Um, we'll have a guest lecture for that. One of my graduate students will be giving that class because I'll be in Salem that day. Um, this is how you find me. We basically talked about that already. Um, prerequisites, textbook, D2L, et cetera. Um, here's that link to the YouTube channel. Here are the exams. Um, here I have the 16th of March. I'll find out which one of those is correct. Anybody know? The top of your head? I'll make sure that's correct. I'll let you guys know. Um, closed book. Oh, one thing I forgot to mention for exams. Um, no time limit for exams. Uh, you should be able to get finished in about half an hour. Most people usually do the fastest ones. 50 minutes should be more than enough. 65 should be way more than enough. But if for any reason you need more time, um, it's not a problem. And we'll go up in the back. If there's another class here, um, we can hang out. I've had people take three hours for my exams. I've also plotted um, time to turn them in versus grade, and it's a flat line. So I'm not sure how much it actually necessarily helps you. Um, but that being said, you have to be here before the first person turns in their exam because I let you keep your exams. Um, and so if somebody walks out with the exam, nobody can come in and start taking it after that. A uh, couple of dates again. You know, keep changing my mind on when the final is. I'll go back and check. It's a regular final time for this class. Uh, midterm one, first February 24th. In terms of withdrawals of the class, changing grading options, they're all there. Talked about grading already. Um, incompletes, I use the university incomplete policy. It's all here. Um, if you are registered with the DRC, you need to get in touch with me and remind me about that. Um, because I hand out exams afterwards, you have to take the exam at the same time as the rest of the class. So if you are registered with DRC and need extra testing accommodations, that has to happen at the same time. Uh, title line, have to put this in here. No discrimination, sexual harassment will be allowed. I have to report any incidents. I'm actually required by law to do that as a state employee. A um, couple of things about a diversity and inclusion. Non-discrimination policies, yes, it's fine. Need to be respectful of everyone else. I'm not going to accept it if that's not the case. Um, I did want to mention this one here at the very end, just really briefly. If you feel uncomfortable about anything that's going on in this class, even like some comment that I made, some aside that you feel is dissing you, let me know. Um, I probably am clueless. Ask my wife, I'm clueless. So that is something that I really need to know. And it can be you know, email, it can be anonymous to the ombudsman, et cetera. But please, please, please let me know. And if it's something about the other students, we'll try and, and deal with that in the best way that we possibly can. Uh, right at the end, learning objectives. Again, this is stuff that I think you should know after this class, but you know, we'll see how, how well you actually get there, um, given, again, some of these exams, etc. So let's switch back over to Keynote and talk about the very last thing here. Speaking of which, um, another new thing that I'm doing this year is an assessment. Basically, hopefully, the stuff you will have learned by the end of the class, but if you know it already, it's kind of pointless to do this, right? So um, I put a quiz up on D2L. Should actually be available in about 
20 minutes. Um, 10 questions, basically going through a lot of those learning objectives. Um, it is not graded. Everybody who does it is going to get 10 points. Or not 10 points, 5 points. <sighs> 5 points, go back. Reverse. It's the problem with recording these things. I need to go back and edit them, or at least mention this. Um, you have until next Monday. I know next Monday is a holiday, but a week should be plenty of time. Once you start, it's 10 minutes to go through these things. Um, and basically, it's to give me an idea. If you know all of these things already, then we can do some really cool, really hard stuff. Um, but I, I doubt that will be the case. So I expect that these questions will be challenging. Um, and it's just a case of, again, doing some of this assessment so that you know, the powers that be say, hey, they actually learned something in this class, or oh, they learned nothing in your class. Stedman, you're worthless. So um, all kinds of different ways of, of doing that. So are there any questions about how the class is supposed to work before we um, move on and actually talk about stuff? Yeah. Uh, what are you going to do about smell days? Are you going to message us? Um, are you going to message us? Okay, so the question is, what about snow days? Am I going to message you or um, just insist that you'll be here, you know, rain or snow or ice, et cetera? Um, so it's always going to be um, with the university schedule. So for instance, if they'd done a late opening at noon today, there would have been no lecture today. What I try and do in cases like that, since I'm recording these lectures anyway and putting them up on YouTube, I will sit down at home in front of my laptop and record it and post it. So that's the way I'm planning on doing things. How we deal with clicker questions, we'll cross that bridge when we come to it. Um, maybe I'll do a quiz on, on D2L or something like that. But yeah, so it's, it's a great question and craziness this year. Climate change, maybe, maybe not. <laughs> yeah, global cooling, if anything. Um, any other questions about how the class is supposed to be functioning? At least how I'd like it to function. OK, good. Any of them come up again, please um, just go ahead and, and email me. So for the rest of today, um, what I'd like to talk about is basically sort of the overview of chapter one here. Moving it around a little bit, because I think that there are some things that are even more important than others. Um, start out talking about the three domains, and then the central dogma. Hopefully, both of these things should mean something to you. Yes? Good? No? Hey. Um, and then very briefly, DNA, RNA, and protein, and then a little bit about genomics. And again, with a possible exception of the central dogma, um, we could spend all year talking about these things. So a couple of things about the three domains of life. And really important as far as this class is concerned is that we all use the same molecules for genetic material, for replication, for transcription, for translation, et cetera, whether we are what's on the outside or whether the, the hundred plus million microbes that are in our gut, all using exactly the same very basic processes in terms of how DNA is made into DNA, how DNA is made into RNA, how RNA is made into protein, et cetera. So we're really going to concentrate in this class, particularly the beginning of it, on things that are the same across the board. And that is another way of talking about conservation. If you find something that is true in us versus true in E. coli and true in sulfalobus, anybody heard of sulfalobus? You know what sulfalobus is? Hey, what's he talking about? Um, it's an archaeobacterium. Um, and we work on it in my lab. So anytime we talk about archaea, sulfalobus is sort of the, the best way of looking at it. In fact, here's sulfalobus um, right there in archaea. But if it's true in sulfalobus, it's true in E. coli, it's true in us. It's really something which is pretty fundamental. So again, getting back to fundamentals of biology. Conserved, conserved means that it's something which has since life arose, been kept around. And the reason it's been kept around is probably because of evolution, saying this works. And if you change it, and as we talk about DNA replication, we'll see there are lots of problems that happen to DNA. 
that if it's something which is still around, it's still being conserved, it's something that's likely to be really important for the actual function of whatever that is. And we'll take a look at that in just a second. One thing you can do once you've found these very conserved molecules, in particular, as we'll talk more and more about conserved nucleotide sequences, you can compare all of these sequences to each other. And then by just basically counting up the differences between different organisms and these different sequences, you can actually get an idea of how things are molecularly related to each other. And that's exactly what's shown down here in the the tree of life, or particularly this one up here, which is one that I like actually a little bit better. Um, this is looking at the small subunit RNA of the ribosome, probably one of the most conserved sequences in all of biology, if not the most conserved sequence in all of biology. All cellular organisms have ribosomes, and all of those ribosomes have large and small subunits. All of them are made up of RNAs. All of them need to do translation. So those are very conserved sequences, but there's still some differences in them. And basically you sort of line them up. One of the things that Carl Woese found in the late 1970s, early 1980s, is there are actually three groups of organisms. There's archaea, bacteria, and eukarya. And probably eukarya, like us, you are humans, um, are derived from something similar to the archaea um, back towards the last universal common ancestor. So, you know, one cell or one set of types of cells. And because all of our DNA, our genetic code, everything else is so similar, it's really good evidence that we've arisen from one common ancestor. Now, there probably were a whole bunch of other things around back then, but they didn't do as well as our great 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 grandparents. So another way of looking at this is the way they have down here in the textbook. You notice these big gray areas here? And that's because we really don't know what happened a lot in these sequences. And there are lots of arguments, and we could spend a long time talking about the various different arguments about why all of these things should be fitting together and where the first eukaryote um, came from in the beginning. And so lots of people like to draw the trees like this with nice branches all branching off of each other. Uh, the real phylogeny of life is probably much more like a bush rather than a nice tree. Lots of different branches all crossing with each other, um, et cetera. And the classic example of that is, in fact, us and all eukaryotes, because there was clearly a bacteria that got inside of a proto-eukaryote, which may or may not have been like an archaean, um, and then became the mitochondria. So that's clearly this, these things you know, crossing over with each other. Um, and you know, all of this you can only really understand in, in thinking about evolution. Um, just as a quick aside, you know, again, here you are. Uh, Hopefully you can see that over there. Uh, basically to say that at a molecular level, humans are pretty darn boring. Uh, we're very, very similar molecularly to all other animals, which you ever, can't even see on here, and quite similar to all plants and all fungi. Relative to a number of other eukaryotes, mostly single cellular eukaryotes, which molecularly are actually way more different from each other and have probably been evolving separately for much, much longer. And so that brings me to my last point here. Microbes rule. Um, relative to absolute numbers, molecular diversity, metabolic diversity, um, you name it, microbes have us, have us down. And in fact, there are, think about here to the floor, um, there are probably 10, if not 100 times more microbes in there than there are of me in terms of my cells. So definitely microbes rule. Um, quick thing, sort of emphasizing the conservation aspect. Um, I mentioned that probably one of the most conserved nucleic acid sequences we have is that small subunit of the ribosome. It's actually a piece of the small subunit of the ribosome right here. 
got the human sequence at the top and the bottom, E. coli in here, and then Methanococcus, everyone's favorite archaea, except for me. <laughs> um, so another um, Archaebacterium. And the green box is basically showing where you have really good conservation, very few changes. You see there's basically just one change here in this segment, the C and the T, between humans sequence and the archaeal sequence. Few more differences between E. coli and the archaea and between E. coli and human down here. On the other hand, there are regions that are a lot less well conserved and are probably going to be less important for function or important for a function which is specific to that group of organisms. It could be specific to humans or it could just be all eukaryotes. In this case, we're picking things from you know, really, really different diverse places. So <clears throat> that's the importance. And when I talk about something which is conserved, that's what I mean, similar sequences between these different organisms. Everything, whenever Stedman puts air quotes on anything, um, you should go, what? what's he talking about there? Well, everything that's not viral, which are the coolest biological entities on the planet, and probably off planet too, um, is cellular. Viruses are not cellular, although we can, that's a whole discussion for the virology class next term. All of you should take virology, amazing class. No, um, <clears throat> but all of the other biological entities out there are cellular. And basically, a lot of these things look extremely similar to each other at their single cell stage. What they develop to afterwards could be very, very different, but the individual cells here are pretty darn similar to each other. And so the textbook spends a long time talking about this because there's cell biologists who write about it. Um, but it really is true. You know, it's really about the cells. And really, what we're concentrating on for the next 10 weeks is what's going on on the inside of those cells, particularly the individual molecules, and again, particularly the nucleic acids in there. Now, why particularly the nucleic acids? Um, how many of you know the name of this cute sheep over here? Dolly. Dolly. Oops. Anyone know the name of the mother? I think it was 547, actually, was the name of the mother. <laughs> so, um, this was the cloning of the sheep, um, basically taking the nucleic acid from one cell and putting it into another that didn't have any nucleic acid in it. Actually, it's a nucleus that they did in this particular case. A lot of reasons about that otherwise. Um, but by doing that, you can end up with a whole organism just based on the DNA. And people have also shown with the DNA that's what happens. It even happens with the most important organisms on the planet, viruses, same thing. Um, it's all about the DNA. If you just put this DNA into a cell, the right environment, it will make more of what you started with. And so there's lots of things that make one sheep slightly different from another one. Identical twins are not completely identical to each other. And that has to do with the next step, which is really the so-called environmental impacts to this DNA. And we'll talk basically for almost the whole rest of the class about this, is how bits of DNA get turned into something and how that's actually being regulated. And so that's all about this environment here, how you go from these cells to these things that look so different relative to each other. We said it's all about the DNA. You just take the DNA and you pop it into a cell, you will get a genetically identical offspring to that. But Dolly actually ended up getting arthritis kind of early, which might have had to do with the modifications to part of her genome. There were actually a couple of inversions that happened in the genome relative to the DNA that came in the first place. If I remember correctly, Dolly was only one of about 43 that they tried to get with this cloning procedure that actually worked. The other ones didn't end up developing properly. So there's lots of other things that are going on here. So how do you get to 
this kind of phenotype down here at the bottom. It's mostly about proteins. There are some exceptions to this as well. But the basic idea is the DNA is sufficient, but not necessarily going to give you absolutely everything. Making more of the DNA, you clearly have to do, and DNA will drive its own copying, the replication process. That's going to be most of chapter five, three or four lectures. Then DNA is used to make RNA, and the thing which is really missing in here is that RNA then has a lot of influences over here, um, not just being used for translation purposes. So when people talk about the central dogma, what they mean is DNA goes to DNA, it's the replication process, DNA goes to RNA, RNA goes to protein. And there's, in fact, some very interesting theory, um, just not required for this class at all, um, about why that has to be in this direction. You have to go from RNA to protein. You can't go informationally from protein back to RNA. But what about RNA to DNA? Can you do that? Yes, you can. Reverse transcription. Present, of course, in viruses. Exactly. Um, first found in viruses, it turns out that there's a number of cellular systems that also use reverse transcription as well. Um, so the central dogma, which was basically a nice way to explain things, there are certainly some exceptions to it. But at least the theory is there should be no reverse translation. And that's basically what this is talking about down here at the bottom. So an overview of some of the players in this. And again, this is very much an overview. We'll get back into a lot more detail about these things later on. And I will try and get my favorite prop, my DNA model, and bring that with me for the next couple of lectures. Um, so DNA has a couple of things that are really important about it. And this should all be review for you. But these are some aspects that I really want people to think about. DNA is polar. Now, when I say polar, I mean polar here in a molecular biology sense, not in a chemistry sense. It doesn't have to do with separation of charge at all. It has to do with one end being different than the other end. Five prime to three prime, three prime to five prime. Polarity, whenever I talk about that in this class, and I'll be a couple of sections when we talk about chemistry next time, but 99% of the time when I talk about polarity, it's going to be this kind of polarity, that there'll be a front end and a back end to any of the macromolecules we talk about here. DNA, RNA, protein, they all have a polarity to them. If they didn't have a polarity to them, it'd be really hard to use them for genetic information. So this is a very, very important point that I wanted to talk about. DNA is symmetric. Hopefully this is something that's really obvious to you. But one thing that you should also always remember is that polarity is also symmetric. So if you've got a five prime to three prime strand here, the opposite strand is going to be the opposite way around. It's always going to be symmetric, but going in the opposite polarity. So if you've got a five prime to three prime strand going one way, the other one's going to be three prime to five prime. So that's very important in terms of thinking about DNA. It's a little hard to see on here. Um, let's do this play. Someone stop showing me. Um, see this little bump at that end, a little bump at that end? Um, this is trying to show you the polarity. Um, here, the individual building blocks of the DNA also have a polarity. So any stretch of DNA, be it a million base pairs long or one base pair in length, always has polarity. Sorry if I missed that before. Yeah. Mm -hmm. we, we talk about the pop strand as being a five to three prime end, right? So the question is here, conventionally, do we talk about the top as being five to three and the bottom as being three to five? Um, the answer is no. It really depends where you actually are as far as the ribose is concerned, the ribose sugar, and where the backbone is. And we'll talk much more about that later on. So you can have the top be three to five, and the bottom be five to three, and vice versa. Yeah, and it's, 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 an, and it's not an arbitrary thing. It really has to do with the chemical structure, which is there. And we'll spend a lot more time talking about that. Um, DNA is generally complementary. If you've got 
an adenine on one side, you're going to have a thymine on the other side. And that's how you get this symmetric kind of structure. How do you make more DNA? You have lots of polymerases and accessory factors, etc. But as far as we're concerned here, it's all about making a copy from a template. Um, and that's basically just shown here. You have one strand of DNA, and then because you have this wonderful complementarity, A's always pair with T's, G's always pair with C's, you can make an extra copy. What's the problem with this? Chicken or the egg? Where do you start? How do you get the first strand in the first place? We'll get there. Uh, but it's, it's clearly an issue. Whenever you have this, you know, separate out, you make a copy, fine. But you have to have something to start with. And so where do you start with in the first place? Um, so that's the process of doing replication. We'll see just a second. Same thing for transcription. You've got a copy. You make a complementary copy to that. One of the things that hopefully should be immediately obvious, if you have one polarity on this strand, while you're making it, it's now the opposite polarity on the opposite strand. So yes, they're base pairing with each other, but they're always going to be in the opposite polarity. So we have this chicken and egg problem. If you're copying something, you always have to come up with the first thing in the first place. but potentially what I always like to say the saving grace of DNA, is that you have double the amount of information. You have a backup copy, like we always should do with our phones, right? We back them up all the time. Yeah, good. Uh, so there's always a backup copy. That's one of the great things about DNA, is that the information is actually redundant. You've got two copies of it. Even if you're a haploid organism that just has you know, one of the... Um, the <clears throat> copies of your genome. So <clears throat> as I mentioned before, transcription is just going from DNA to RNA. And again, it's the same process. You take a DNA, you make a complementary copy to it in the opposite orientation. One of the really neat things about RNA, which is rather different from DNA, is that you start at various different positions in the genome. But more importantly, is you can make many, many copies of one specific piece of DNA. So it's an amplification process. The transcription process is amplifying. You can make many, many copies here, pardon me, um, of your, eh, sometimes this pointer works well, sometimes it doesn't. Um, here we are. You make many copies here, again, complementary to the sequence that you started with here. Um, many copies. And so you can amplify one particular piece of DNA. And so that's that first step that you go between the cell, which has all these DNAs in it, to actually now becoming something which will look like a mouse, a sea urchin, a sulfalobus, um, you name it. RNA is also famous because it's Got some slight differences. One, of course, R versus D. Um, what does the R stand for? It's ribose instead of deoxyribose. And again, we'll look at that structure in a lot more detail later on. It has uracil instead of thymidine. How do you know why? Probably. Probably has to do with DNA repair. Um, and probably there was a um, deoxyuracil at some point. Again, we'll get back to that a little bit later on. Um, one of the things that I find confuses people quite a lot and bugs the heck out of me, um, is that people always talk about RNA as being single-stranded. Well, when I think of something being single-stranded, I usually think about it as being something sort of you know, floating around with the base pairs just hanging out. Well, that's usually not what RNA looks like. RNA is almost always base paired as well. And so you actually do have two strands here. This base pairing happens in just the same way that DNA base pairs. So you actually also have to have opposite polarity on how these are binding with each other. And so I like to think of RNA as often being a single molecule as opposed to being a single strand. But 
you know, the, 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 it's a slight difference, but I think the main thing here is that most RNA, most of the time, the nucleotides are actually base paired with each other rather than just sort of floating around in space. Yeah? So the, the question here, and so I'm just repeating this, and, get, and correct me if I'm <laughs> misinterpreting this, but here, so, um, and I'm going to change it slightly and say the base pairs in the RNA are always interacting with the bases, oh, actually, the base, I should say, is always interacting with the base on the same molecule yeah. of RNA. Um, that's not always true. There actually, you do have two molecule RNAs sometimes. And sometimes we'll, people will talk about double-stranded RNA, which is, is bound. Turns out that CRISPR, um, that I mentioned right at the very beginning, she has a lot to do with double-stranded RNA, two different RNA molecules that are interacting with each other. But the main point here is it's usually not, not base paired. Each of those bases is usually interacting with another base or at least something else. It's usually not sort of floating around in space. And so that's the the quote single-stranded here. Uh, because of that, RNAs, um, one molecule, multiple molecules bound to each other, um, have structure, which gives them function, function exactly. Um, and one of the things that we found, again, in the last 10 years or so, is that RNAs are also really, really important for regulatory purposes. And we're just beginning to scratch the surface on how important a lot of these RNAs are for regulatory purposes. Um, RNAs, it turns out, are also absolutely critical for translation. So that last part of the central dogma, going from RNA to protein. Uh, how many of you know about the Millennium Prizes? Three, mil three million bucks from the Google people and the Facebook people, et cetera, sort of the other, the alternative Nobel Prize, the Millennial Nobel Prize. Uh, just went to Harry Noller um, from the University of California, Santa Cruz, who's a jazz musician, race car driver, and spent a career working on the ribosome, and basically showed that the ribosome and almost all of the translation machinery is RNA. You can get rid of all the proteins in the ribosome and it will still take a messenger RNA template and make protein from it. It's really pretty amazing. It's really all about the RNA. So the ribosome in and of itself can function. It doesn't function very well, but it can function just as RNA. Yeah. So the question here is, you know, would the cell then function without the extra proteins? So these experiments that I was talking about that Harry Noller did were what we call um, in vitro, in glass, probably in plastico because it was in a test tube. Um, but yeah, so all of that was done in the absence of cells. There are some interesting questions which you may have a chance to talk about later in terms of what was called the RNA world or the RNA protein world before DNA was invented, probably by viruses. Um, and that could have been something about that back at that time, but whether there were cells, all kinds of other things we could get into here. But those experiments that I talked about, that was all done in an in vitro case with purified ribosomes, purified RNA, purified components that went into it. Yeah, sorry in the back. Yeah, so the, the, the question here, I'm going to paraphrase your question, is basically, what are those proteins there for anyway? <laughs> um, and the answer is probably mostly stability, and we'll talk much more about that when we talk about the ribosome, which is this just amazing machine. And now we know at an atomic detail how the ribosome was put together, but also how the ribosome works. This is, again, literally in the last five years or so. Um, we've learned a huge amount about the structures of these things. Um, and so we know a lot more about that particular process in answering your question. Uh, so <clears throat> it's not just the ribosome. Of course, um, hopefully all of you know that this, what this is, it's a transfer RNA. They're not nice clover leaves. You'll notice that this is 
one molecule, but where are all those bases? They're all paired with each other. Um, and so this is really classic in terms of thinking about RNA. And the RNA in the um, ribosome is also um, extremely similar to that as well. Translation, again, we'll talk much more about this. Um, I like to think of translation as sort of the special decoder ring um, that you might find in a box of Cracker Jack. And again, anyone get any of those references? Probably not. I'm too old. Um, <clears throat> But yeah, how you can go from the nucleic acid language to the amino acid language, and that process is what's called the, um, the genetic code. So again, you need transfer RNAs. That's this guy up at the top here. Um, and the ribosome um, down at the bottom. What you make out of this are stretches of amino acids. Those stretches of amino acids in some cases will come together to make an enzyme which will catalyze chemical reactions, which is shown here. Um, particular enzymes, the lysozyme molecule, was, will catalyze this hydrolysis of a longer chain sugar. We'll talk more about that a little bit later on. What we're most interested in here is that this, again, polar molecule, it's got a start and a stop, forms a structure, and this is of course classically where the biochemists all say his structure is going to give you function. And usually the vast majority of a protein here has actually very little to do with his actual activity. It's mostly putting everything together in order to give you a very specific structure in one small part of the molecule. And we'll talk a little bit about that, but mostly that's going to be a, in a biochemistry course. So on a broader scale, and this is something that, again, the, the book likes to get into in um, a big way, which I think is maybe a little extreme, but it's certainly the direction a lot of molecular biology, and particularly cell biology, is going. And that's in thinking about this whole process in terms of systems and trying to understand the flow, the dynamics, and hopefully actually be able to model something. Now, a wonderful case out in the future somewhere, is that, say you're a doctor, I'm guessing a few of you might be interested in doing that, um, patient comes in with a particular symptom, and you can then have that symptom, and by looking at all of the models in terms of all the cells work, and all of the molecules with the drugs that your pharmacist happens to have, and can say, hey, I'm going to use this to treat that. Now, getting there is clearly a very long way off, but that's sort of the idea. Certainly at a cellular level, we're beginning to get some of the ideas on how some of these things work. And it really has to do with understanding this process of the catalytic information and the sequence information, how all of these things feed back into each other. So we talked about you know, central dogma, where we've got these nucleotides, the DNA makes DNA, and then the DNA, in terms of the information, makes the RNAs, which can then get translated into the proteins. Well, it turns out that, at least now, maybe back in the original RNA world it wasn't the case, but all these proteins are actually the ones that are doing the job. They are making the RNA. They're making the DNA. They're actually helping out in terms of the ribosome, in terms of making the protein um, in the first place. So all of these things are really interlinked with each other. And so we'll spend a little bit of time, particularly towards the end, talking about some of these regulatory processes, how a lot of these loops actually interact with each other. So I'm going to stop after one more little thing here on the slide, because I love this slide so much. Um, we'll start next time talking about what genomes are, but they aren't this. So I'll see you on Wednesday, assuming that there's not a massive snowstorm between now and then. <laughs>